people who are a little different. And so I think the second thing that we have noticed is uh, allyships. Whoever your um, ally is in the other organization, generally it's a one-person shot. You know, this is our our uh, um, uh, person who's the director for um, special businesses or outreach or what have you. And then you don't really have a lot of allies within the other parts of the organization. We would encourage people to develop allies in the mature company or the, uh, uh, the younger company. Either somebody two spots above. I think that's my rec generally my recommendation. You know, try to you know develop a relationship that's two spots above you, and then in some cases at least a spot below you. So you get a different understanding. The perspective of business looks different from a VP spot as opposed to a program manager spot, as opposed to somebody who's maybe down in charge of maintenance or somebody who's you know productivity. And so take the time to develop those allies, those relationships, because they get not only the benefit of seeing you as a person, understanding your business as a person, but also you get the benefit of what that resource is, what that expertise is at a level that you're not necessarily working at. You know, yeah. what I have found is that there is a perception around small business, adult business, and those kinds of things. Can you all hear me okay? Um, and so, and, and looking, it's trash day. Trash day. And looking <laughs> at looking at this, um, what I'd like people to understand is that my observation has been that there are a lot of savvy small companies that are out there. I think that when you look at the innovation that they bring, you look at how they leverage technology. It is not your grandfather's small business. So I think if people have that paradigm shift in terms of how to do that. I have a couple of our businesses here today that are certified with my organization. And we have four classes revenue, four revenue classes. Class one, your revenue is less than a million. Class two, um, if your, your revenue is one to 10, 10 million. Class three, 10 to 50 million. And class four, over, over 50 million in revenue a year. We're about to execute, and this is, we're part of a nationwide uh, organization, and we're about to execute class five because a lot of, of some of our MBEs have crossed over the billion dollar um, threshold. And so saying that is just understanding, taking a perspective of who you're dealing with. And then um, I, I, and understanding what they have to bring to the table. And I think that it then makes it well. There's a Chinese saying that says, if you want to know what is at the end of the road as somebody that's coming back. And so the other thing I contend that we need to do and what we advise people to do is to ask somebody. Yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's all about the, the feedback loop in, in, in those relationships. You know, being, having that understanding, that caring to share the good, the bad, the ugly, and the best partnerships are the ones that know that they have the other person's best you know, intentions there, but they, they, they're sharing that feedback because they want to make them better. And, you know, whether it's company to company or whether it's your company and how you uh, interact and give space to your employees, constantly seek that feedback because it's only going to make your company better and it's only going to make the partnership um, better. And I, you know, the other thing is, is, is giving back as well. Like, when you experience success, remember who helped you know, get you there. And whether it's, it's mentoring or champ, championing or, uh, you know, I think of uh, my friend Delali, Fearless Solutions up in Baltimore. Uh, I remember 11 years ago when he was starting his company and now he's experienced a lot of success and he's created Hutch, which is an incubator program for 20 small um, companies and, and we're still involved in, in helping them. Um, but that's giving back and that's remembering who helped get you there, and uh, you know, it's 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 all about the feedback. So for me, you know, Lagos is a is a large company, and I think that one of the reasons why I was put into my position and why the small business office was put under strategic partnerships was a lot of what has been said on the panel today. That I don't think that Lagos looked at the mentor protege program quite as strategically or as a partnership. We looked at it as the government mandates it, you have to do it, let's check the box, right? So 
so now that it's being brought up under the strategic partnership team, one of the things that we're really looking at is, is looking at our mentor proteges as a relationship and putting you know the right sponsorship person in place so that they can guide them through our organization as to how do they succeed. And you know that kind of goes back to your, your original question is what is success for me? Success for me is that that mentor proje is getting on a proposal, that they are able to get into the proposal pit, that they're able to see what the large businesses do even if it's just to you know sit back in and watch some of the things that they're doing and, and pick up from there and then have a person in our organization that they can have communication with if they have questions if they're unsure about something what should they do next how should they continue to grow and then ultimately graduate from the program and not just graduate but continue to be a part of the the Lido's ecosystem so that that for me is where I would see success be Thank you. Thank you. Very, very insightful. So now uh, the next question is going to be about, and, uh, and you know, when we were thinking about this question, we did want to showcase kind of what does go wrong when you're trying to enter into these agreements. Um, it's definitely not roses and butterflies, right? So uh, for each of you, um, this question, and, and, and obviously, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have it uh, framed in, from a different vantage point, but what are the behaviors and traits that you've witnessed that, and it doesn't have to be with your company, but you've seen in the industry and elsewhere that derails um, MPPs, JVs, or even just engagement with small businesses. Um, did you want to start first, and then we'll go to Greg? I can start. Yeah. Again, you know, being relatively new to to the Minute Protege programs in this in this industry, one of the things that I have seen is. Some of the mental proteges that I have today are not active. They're not participating. They're not coming to us. They're, at least in my opinion, sometimes sitting back hoping that, you know, we grab them and pull them in. I need you to kind of engage with me. Meet me in the middle. Tell me where you think you might want to, to engage with one of our businesses or one of our proposals or something like that. And how can you do that? And then I can help guide you to the right, to the right area. So, for me, that's where you know I'm hoping to change a little bit of that, but it, you know, just looking at our list of proteges now, I've asked the question: Well, what proposals have they won, and you know, how 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 have they done? And a, it's very difficult to get that information in a lot of cases, but B, they haven't won anything, and they've been in the program for two, three, four years. So I really need the mental proteges to to really engage with us a little bit more. Great. Right. Yeah. I'll talk to the small business perspective. Um, you know, especially in the beginning, the the business owner is, is is linked to the hip with their their company. And when there's a financing need, you know, we're looking at the personal finances just like we're looking at the the company finances. And it's it's really important for businesses to retain money in the business, not to take everything out of the business because. It, it allows for that flexibility down the line if something were to happen, um, you know, that they have that emergency cushion. And, and a lot of times I, I see some companies when they start to experience some success start to spend a little bit more, you know, on the personal side. And, it, it, you know, you're taking away from the company and, and you're not building uh, that, that emergency cushion for the future. So. I think it's really important to, to have a strong set of advisors, the attorney, the CPA, um, other small business advisors, uh, be connected in your community with the different, uh, the FCAs, the CCAPs, the uh, CEO boardrooms, the, the, the organizations that, um, you know, where you can really network and meet some of the other companies as well, but like more importantly, you can hear best practices, you know, from talking to those companies and, you know, where are those spilled milk stories, where do they, where did that company wish that they did something differently, you know, back in the day? So do you guys offer any kind of education to these smaller businesses so they don't fall into that trap? Yeah, no, and, and, that but that, that goes back to the feedback and being very candid with them. And, yeah. and listen, my, my, my bankers sometimes don't get the best responses from their companies when they give them that candid, uh, candid feedback, but, it, you know, it is what it is. And sometimes we'll hear, well, another bank is going to give me, you know, more money and... I, you know, listen, like we're, we're coming at it from an advisory standpoint and it's not all about that. It's about how you can be most successful 
in, in, in the longevity. long run and, and, the, and longevity. And it's not what they want to hear sometimes, but uh, it's a message that needs to be delivered. Um, it's a couple of things. It's setting expectations. And I totally agree with what you're, you're saying um, in, in terms of doing that. Um, one of the great things about what the SBA has done um, in terms of streamlining the program, it's, it allows multiple JVs. And so it, t it took away that cap and restriction. Um, and so things that kind of derail, well, love isn't always at first sight, right? And so if you enter into a relationship and it doesn't work out, if you haven't planned for the divorce, you're screwed. And so if you take it from that approach um, and just understand um, perspectives around, it's, it's about business, but it's about getting into that relationship. And then, you know, with the relationship, I like to be courted, right? I'm not saying that I really want to be courted, but you understand what I mean in terms of developing that business relationship. Did you take the time? to understand what those nuances are. Do you understand what the shortcomings are? Um, from a um, protege perspective, piggybacking on what Greg has said, are you undercapitalized? You know, have you made the investment in your infrastructure that you're now ready to do business with someone else? And so it's taking all those elements that are in play, you know, that come into play, um, and, but those are the kinds of things that can derail a relationship. I absolutely agree. I think that um, going back to this understanding of managing uh, expectations, I think that's really important. You know, when we sometimes are working with a woman-owned business, um, she hasn't worked out the relationship her husband has to the business, right? Um, and so is he really an advisor or is he doing something else, right? Um, and that goes to the nature of their relationship. And I would say that's also true with mature companies as well as the younger companies. Um, you know, everyone has said it here, it's very important. Can you have that hard conversation? Like when they first get that check from the government or that second check to the government, are they running right out and buying a $100,000 car? You know, and you might say to yourself, wow, that doesn't happen, but it happens, yep. right? Um, the other thing that when you have somebody in a mature company who's helping a business, they've never run a business before. Now they might be a VP in their company, they might have been a good company man, and they've been there for 10 years or 15 years, and they think they understand. But you're dealing with an entrepreneur, you're dealing with somebody who maybe started their business, you know what I'm saying, in their garage, you know, like Bill Gates, or they started their business at their buddy's house, you know, working after school every day, right? So. They are very tied, very connected to who their clients are, how they're doing business, you know, and what kind of money they're making. So I would say one of the things that gets derailed, and I would agree to everyone here, you know, the relationship doesn't work out. You know, initially you say you have the same goals on, 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 you know, on paper. You say you have the same relationship, authentic with each other, that you care about each other's growth. Um, but at the end of the day, you really don't respect each other. Right? So that large company, that VP, doesn't want to drive down to your hub zone location in an iffy transitional you know, neighborhood. So he doesn't want to go to a place where there's no Starbucks to meet with you. Um, and so what, what do you get from that? You get from that, hey, they don't really care about me, or they're just using me to meet that 23% threshold. You know, the reverse is true. You know, I've worked with a large business. Um, uh, we, you know, we have uh, joined in a joint venture with a large law firm, and the first event they invited us to was the country club to play around a round of golf. You know, nobody sort of said, hey, do you play golf? You know, um, and they thought that that was their attempt to reach out to us. You know, one of the um, uh, women who was, you know, part of that outreach program complimented me on having straight hair instead of dreads. She was fearful, you know, that my small diverse firm meant that I would be, you know, ethnic. Um, she thought that was help. So remember that use some common sense, not just your business um, sense, about how these relationships work and then when they don't work, you know, as she said, what, you know, what happens then? You know, do you go to your lawyer and say, hey, how do we terminate this when you both have a contract? Um, so I'm, I'm reiterating what, what my three panelists have said and, and I'm sure Olivia will agree with me. But, but those are important mechanisms that you need to think about before you go down that road, before you start that process.
so much good stuff and so much funny, so many funny stories I could tell about husbands and all that other kind of stuff. Um, I think um, I agree with everybody, so the, I really I think the, the two things that I would add about um, derailing would be a lack of empathy because things do change and it's important to pivot sometimes and I think if there's a commitment and you can be empathetic and understanding why that mentor can't offer what they are, what they promise to, or what the protege, um, you know, is unable to give, offer, or you know, et cetera, then at least, um, you know, kind of empathizing with that and and reevaluating the arrangement and determining if the new set of objectives um, is something that both are are interested in. Um, I know that with um, our are, and, and, and I think it's kudos to Grant Thornton again, they have a lot more holidays and PTO typically than we did. So um, it's something that I did not think of when going into the mentor-protege relationship and that really offset my budget a little bit because I was assuming I built a forecast and a budget based on 10 federal holidays, X amount of weeks PTO, but if my folks can't work as a subcontractor to that, you know, prime because they are offering something, you know, more for their employees, then then what's the workaround? And again, the empathy existed and it was, well, if there's budget on the contract, those people can make up the time on the other days or, you know, something like that, and we work together. So um, I would say empathy is key. If, it, if you are able to actually get in the trenches with that partner before making the commitment, I would agree to do that. I remember both my parents were born in Italy, and um, they did not want me to move in with my husband before getting married, but I said, oh, no, no, that is going to happen, and I want to see his credit score, and I want to see... <laughs> they, they, they talked to Greg, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Financial investigation. <laughs> Um, beforehand, and I think that that's uh, fair to say in, in when you're building a mentor-protege relationship, if you can try to do business together on contract, um, that would be helpful. Of course, larger businesses tend to have multiple divisions, and you can't stereotype a company based on one experience for sure, um, but there are some handbook-type scenarios that you will have to go through you know, accounting systems, oh, we have to put our information into Dell Tech and ours, and they want copies of it. Okay, how should we account for that in the process, in our onboarding, you know, things like that. It's, it's going to be important, especially when you have incredible success together. Um, what you said, Stacy, correct? The minus, yeah, is so true. I've seen many, of, plenty of protégés that complain, and it's just like they have their hand out and they're waiting, you know, um, our mentor was so good to us. We just won two prime deals this year, um, over ten million, and both of them we brought our mentor on as a sub to us. And now it's a different kind of learning experience because they're the sub, and we have different vacation days. How are we going to handle goes that? Both goes both <laughs> ways, and so um, that would be my two cents. Yeah, that's a good point because I always tell people, you know, as a mentor, I say, you know, treat. Treat your subs the same way, and some, some of you have heard this, who I've, I've worked with, but treat them the same way you would want to be treated uh, if you were the sub. And, and so, um, you know, that doesn't always happen, and, and, it, and it's a shame, but uh, it's important. Um, I know we're running out of time. We want to open it up to the audience, but um, I did have one other question, and I'm not going to go, um, you guys can just feel free to answer just based on how, um, what perspective you have, but just in the last five to ten years, um, and whoever wants to answer this, but in terms of like changes that you've seen, dynamic maybe trajectories, trends that you've seen, um, can you opine on that? Like what you've seen um, change, and is it good, bad, 